I am the Dark Master, and welcome back to the History of Mississippi. In this episode, we will be discussing the Paleocene, the first epoch of the Cenozoic. This epoch, in many ways, is a time of oxymoron. The name itself, Paleocene, means old recent. It was cooler and drier than the previous Cretaceous, yet crocodilians still swam off the coasts of Greenland. The western interior seaway was gone, uniting North America while North and South America were still separated by oceans. The oceans were pretty much modern, however. With the return of coral reefs, only the marine mammals and carcarnid sharks were missing. Reptiles had been knocked down by the previous extinction event. With non-avian dinosaurs extinct, most reptiles had been reduced in size. This wasn't a hard, fast rule, however. In fact, off the coast of Mississippi lived Paleophis, which was a member of an extinct sea snake family. They were huge. The largest species was over 29 feet long, truly a sea serpent in an age of mammals. Boreal Suchus and Camposuchus both survived the asteroid impact, and in some places, they were the dominant predators. In fact, if one got in a time machine and went back this time, one would think birds were taking the ruling status of their relatives, the dinosaurs. With large herbivores like the Gastornis and the predatory terabirds, the birds seem set to rule the world. In the late Paleocene, the first early owls also appeared, with Ogliptex in the U.S. and Bruruornis in France appearing in the Paleocene. Going back to the reptiles for just a bit, Champosaurus was a member of a group called Cordea. They were a strange group of basal archosauromorphs which resembled modern crocodiles. But this wasn't the case for all species. Some resembled small lizards. They were one of the few non-modern reptiles to survive after the KT event and the only extinct group to die out after the KT Event. However, the Cenozoic is called the Age of Mammals for a reason. This is because they exploded in diversity. The Paleocene mammals were dominated by primitive forms that sadly left no descendants. There were also several early representatives of modern mammals, but we'll save them for later. Let's start with the multitibulates, which I have mentioned before. Although some lineages went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, they survived into the Paleocene and reached their peak diversity in size. They ranged from a small mouse to that of a beaver. They had fur, but aside from that, were not related to any groups of mammals alive today. Despite their mysterious relationships, they managed to survive longer than any other order of mammals at a hundred million years, going extinct in the Oligocene period. The teeth of multitibulates closely resemble that of rodents, and are believed to range from omnivores pitilodontus to herbivores like Tanidolabilis. They achieved a, a wide range with Gondwana therans to the south also radiating. However, the arrival of true rodents in the early Oligocene led to their eventual extinction. Marsupials also survived, surprisingly. Mesozoic marsupials are mainly known from North America, where they reached cat size, despite competition from the dinosaurs. Just like the dinosaurs, all but one lineage of North American marsupials went extinct. 
and therefore Mississippian marsupials were likely greatly reduced. This was the Paleocene Paradectes, which went extinct shortly afterwards, leaving a void of marsupials in North America. Starting with placental mammals, the Paleotids were a group of small insectivorous mammals, which we think of when we imagine early mammals. Stranger were another insectivorous group, the Lepticidae, which at first glance resemble a mix between an elephant and a kangaroo. They survived into the Oligocene, while the Leptictids bounded across the forest floor, another group of insectivores took to the water, becoming one of the first groups of aquatic mammals. The Pantolestidae were a group of otter-like mammals, including Paleocinope and Buxodestes. Moving on to larger mammals, no group better illustrates Paleocene mammals than the condylarths. They are believed to be a group of primitive ungulates. The vast majority of them are found in North America, where the most complete Paleocene records are found. They are also in foreign Europe. However, in Asia, they were rare, as they had to compete with the Pantelodonts, but we'll get back to them later. Nowadays, most scientists consider the condylarths a wastebasket taxon, one that only has primitive ungulates despite this view. One cannot forget the role these creatures had, not only in their time, but as the ancestors of modern hoofed mammals. In fact, in some ways, the four families, they filled many niches not filled by their ancestors. The most primitive condylarths were the Arctocynidae, containing the earliest condylarths, the rat-sized Pantungulatum, and the slightly larger Criacus. Unlike later ungulates and even anacondylarths, they had none of the adaptations typical of what we think of ungulates. They could still climb trees if they wanted to, and had flat feet like us. Most were omnivores like bears, or us. Some even went as far to become carnivores, but we'll discuss them later. A typical member was Arctocyon. The other dominant condylar family, aside from the Arctocynidae, were the Periplicidae. They were so successful that less than a million years after the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs, they had already radiated into forms as diverse as the squirrel-sized Aniosochus to the sheep-sized Ectonochus. Yes, at some point, the mighty sheep would have been the biggest animals on the planet. This family was more herbivorous than previous families. Think more of a pig than a bear. The third family, the Hynosopidae, smaller than their other condylarths, they more resembled rodents than other ungulates. They also survived longer, being found in the Eocene after the extinction of the rest of their kind. The most famous member was Hydophodus, for which the group is named. The fourth family of condylos is arguably the most important. The female codids were a second wave of radiation after the other three families appearing in the late Paleocene and are considered the ancestors of pezodactyls, which includes the famous horses and rhinos of modern day. This is not hard to see. Compare the, the late Phenodus to the first horse, Eohippus. At a distance, they look quite similar. They were common too. Phenacodons consisted of 50% of all mammal specimens from this age in North America. Despite this, the largest herbivores were not condylars, rather the pantodonts, the first of the mega mammals, with the largest being more than 1,100 pounds. 
They are believed to have evolved in Asia, but are known from North and South America as well. Pantalolamba was one of the first, and was the smallest at around the size of a sheep. Despite resembling a cat, it was one of the first quote-unquote large browsers. Things got big, starting with Baribelamba, which inhabited North America, who got up to 1,433 pounds and was the size of a pony. The largest pantodont had to be Tetanoides, which resembled a saber-toothed bear, despite it being a herbivore. All three mentioned so far are from North America, but the last of the pantodonts lived in Asia in the form of Coryphidon and Hypercoryphidon, which more resembled hornless rhinos than their more primitive relatives. Unithiers are most well known by their Eocene forms, but the first species evolved in the Paleocene, Prodinoceros. They were the second in a chain of large mammals and slowly replaced pantodonts before being replaced by the even larger brontotheres. A third group of large mammals, the Xenogilete, are believed to be related to the Unithiers, but they're poorly known and are only from South America, so I won't go over them now. But I will say, they did survive until the Pleistocene, long after both Pantodonts and Unithiers. In addition to these large herbivores, there were several groups of specialized archaic mammals. These two groups were called the Tainodonts and the Tilodonts. These two completely unrelated groups evolved into some of the most bizarre mammals of the Paleocene, and that's saying something. Some of the best known is the parrot-beaked Ectogananus. With all this available prey, it is not surprising that multiple lineages of mammals evolved to take advantage of this resource. In the isolated continent of South America and Australia, marsupials took this role in the form of the Bohainidae and Thylacinidae, respectively. However, elsewhere, like in Mississippi, carnivores were dominated by placenta mammals. The three major carnivores were true carnivores, creodonts, and mesonychids. The mesonychids were the largest of these predators and at first glance resemble wolves, but instead of claws had hooves. This characteristic has convinced scientists that they represent a carnivorous branch of the ungulate family. They were much longer than the contemporary creodonts and the carnivores and were the dominant predators of the Paleocene. It is believed that, due to their hooves, they relied more on their jaws for catching and subduing prey. They were three families, the primitive Trisodontidae, the Haplodritidae, and the Mesonychidae themselves. The Trisodontidae were a primitive group that, along with the semi-carnivorous Artonychids, soon went extinct after the Paleocene, and not much is known about them, sadly. The second family, Hapilocondectids, is slightly more well-known. They differ from the other two families in that they were more adapted to a semi-aquatic lifestyle, with teeth designed to help catch prey. They included the species the group is named after, Haplodectes, and the otter like Hononaldon. The third and most famous family was Mesonychidae. They were also the most successful, for they originated in Asia with a small species like Yangilestes. It soon radiated into larger species, such as Zingzaxia from China and the most famous Mesonychid Mesonyx. The family then spread across Asia to Europe and then to North America, evolving into new species like 
Simnopterodon and the largest mesonychid ever to exist. And Caligon, which, just for your Tolkien fans out there, was named after one of Tolkien's dragons. Mesonychid, despite their dominance of the Paleocene, were the shortest lived of the three carnivoran mammals of the Paleocene. Mississippi, being alcopated by the more successful creodonts and the carnivores, with the last genus, Mongolestes, going extinct in the Oligocene. Creodonts are considered by many people to be the first large, obviously carnivorous mammals, even though the Mesonychids were the first. Throughout the history of paleontology, their classification has been changed again and again and again. When first coined by Edward Cope in 1875, he included creodonts, many non-creodonts, and contrastly excluded actual creodonts, like the hyenodonts from the creodont family. Eventually, the non-creodonts and actual creodonts were sorted out. Then came the problem of where they went. At first they were considered the ancestors of monocarnivores, then they were considered to have shared an ancestor with them. Now they are considered related to pangolins, have been evolved their carnivorous adaptions separately from true carnivorans. Regardless of where they land, there were two families of creodons, the superficially cat-like oxenidae and the dog-like hyenidae. Both emerged in the Paleocene and were the dominant predators of the Eocene, taking place of the earlier Mesonychids. But even in the Paleocene, the two dis distinct families emerged, represented by the earlier forms like Oxenia from the early Paleocene and Prodimachion from the late Paleocene. I hope to discuss them more in the next episode. True carnivores, order Carnivora, emerged in the late Paleocene and resembled modern civets in many ways. They were small due to competition for both creodonts and mesonychids. Myanchus is considered the ancestor of all carnivores, cats and dogs. It hunted small mammals in the trees and served as a glimmer that not all Paleocene mammals are weird. Indeed, in addition to true carnivores, the very first proboscians, or elephants as we call them, also emerged. The small erytherium is the oldest, smallest, and most primitive known elephant. We often think of elephants as massive, single animals, because there's only three species alive today. However, they are but the last branch in a formerly huge family. Even today's elephants have some strange relatives, like the adorable hyraxes and manatees. But those are nothing compared to their extinct relatives, which we will discuss later. The third modern-day group of mammals to evolve in the Paleocene were none other than the primates, or us. They, along with a distinct side branch, the rodent-like, slow-climbing, plesdiaforms, were already swinging from the trees like they do. Very little is known from them due to their small and fragile bones, but the earliest primates like Alitosius and Carpolestes indicate that primates were already diverse in the Paleocene. This episode is going to end where most others begin, with stratigraphy and time. The Cenozoic, which consists of the Paleocene and today, was originally divided into two obviously uneven periods, the Tertiary and the Quaternary. Eventually, this system was rightfully deemed inaccurate, and the Tertiary was divided into two. Sadly, they named the first period the Paleogene, which causes confusion because the epoch that it begins with is the Paleocene. The Paleogene includes the Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene. Paleocene ended with the greatest global warming event in the Cenozoic, which is unfortunately being repeated due to raw fossil fuel consumption. If the past is anything to go to, 
And it is, no matter what creationists and climate change deniers say, my home state might be half covered in oceans with tons of seashells and, which by the way are the most common fossils we have from the Paleocene in Mississippi, and fish. So next time, join me when we discuss the Eocene and the rise of whales in the history of Mississippi.